In this episode, I get to sit down and talk to Mark Paradise from Taproot. We get into human factors and human error as a root cause of incidents, why that's so prevalent in industry today, and what we can do to push past it. It's a very interesting conversation. I really enjoyed my time with Mark. I wish I could sit down with him several more times and dive into this, and I'm sure we will in the future. But in this episode, we get to crack open one of my favorite topics when it comes to root cause analysis, diving into incidents and how they occurred, and that is how to deal with the urge to put it on the human as the root cause. So get ready to take notes as I talk with Mr. Mark Paradise from Taproot in this episode. Before we get into today's topic, I want to remind everybody, if your business is reopening after any kind of closure due to COVID, or you've continued to remain open, but you're struggling with how to mark your facilities to ensure physical distancing and relay important information about safety and health as it relates to COVID, I want you to go visit our friends over at Mighty Line Floor Tape. Mighty Line has some great products for you to mark your floors, whether it be the stand here, the six feet distancing, or just floor tape to denote lanes of travel. They have everything you need to mark your facility. So hit the link in the show notes, visit our friends at Mighty Line Floor Tape. They are incredible partners in safety. I can't thank them enough for their support of the podcast. Again, Mighty Line Tape for all of your floor marking needs. Hey, don't forget to visit our friends over at Healthy Roster. You've all heard of on-site injury prevention services, right? Well, that's what Healthy Roster does for those with multiple locations and shifts. And they do it affordably. So head on over to Healthy Roster. Hit the link in the show notes. Go ahead and take a poke around at the website. Dive deeper into the safety ally services they provide. All right. Welcome, Mark. Mark Paradise. Is that correct? That's correct. How cool is that name? <laughs> It's been mine all my life. Right? And that's pretty cool. So, Mark, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us a little bit of background and, uh, you know, background history and professional history, and then what you're doing now for businesses and organizations. Okay. Be glad to. Uh, I'm Mark Paradise. I'm the president of System Improvements. Uh, graduated from the University of Illinois with a BS in electrical engineering. Went into the nuclear Navy for seven years. Uh, was on two nuclear-powered cruisers, USS Long Beach and the USS Arkansas. Um, last two years I was in the Navy, I went back to the University of Illinois and taught midshipman naval weapons and naval history as a ROTC instructor. And while I was there, I got a master's in nuclear engineering, which was, had main emphasis on human factors. It was a new program they were developing that they'd started after Three Mile Island. and um, pretty much I was the first person in it and I had a really good, um, I guess I'll call it mentor in Chuck Hopkins. He was in the psychology department. He was a human factors expert and he really got me into, into, uh, human factors and guided me as to what I needed to know, um, to become quote unquote a human factors expert. And that, uh, led me to getting a job working for DuPont, and that led me to um, developing uh, the first root cause system I developed, and that led me into developing a system for commercial use uh, called Taproot. And so that was back in about 1988, and by 1990. I had started full time. We developed a human performance investigation process for the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We also started, we were working with commercial clients, both in the utility industry and in the oil and gas industry. And that, you know, just basically spread out to us doing this all over the world. We um, pretty rapidly grew to international clients. And it, it was really good timing because the process safety management regulation um, 
was being developed and then just came out and we fit into that perfectly and we got a lot of major clients at major oil companies chemical companies uh, we already had utilities and we branched onto that in a whole bunch of other industries um, so that's that's really so my background in human performance and uh, human factors comes from university of illinois uh, they had a pretty good sized human factors program back in those days some really good uh, people to learn from and I applied that in developing human performance improvement programs, first at DuPont, and then mainly got into root cause analysis, um, really throughout the world. Nice. So human factors, you mentioned that phrase, uh, that term a couple of times. Like, what is human factors for those who, who may have heard it? Maybe they've, they've heard it in, in context of workplace safety. Uh, but maybe they don't understand what it involves. What, you know, real high level, what is human factors? If you can really think of it as usability, you want to make things usable for the operator, the human. There's a human machine interface. The machines do some parts, the humans do some parts, and, and you want to make things usable. Um, that would be the most simple definition. Uh, and of course, on the on the negative side of things, you see accidents all the time caused by human error. Uh, in fact, some people think that's sort of the end of the, at the end of the analysis. There, we found out there was a human error, and we're going to, you know, start out by cautioning the guy, be more careful next time, or maybe we'll fire him, and then we'll have <laughs> everything. Everything will be fixed. Right, fix the person. Right, <laughs> we got to exactly. fix the person. So. So that's a great segue into what we wanted to talk about today, which was, you know, human error as a root cause. Uh, so I've got so many questions. Uh, we, you know, I, I tackle this problem all the time as well, professionally, especially with my colleagues in the safety field. Why do you think human error as a root cause is so, I'm going to say popular? Is, is so easy to put your finger on and be the end of it. Wow. This is because most people don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, we, we teach root cause analysis all the time. And I used to teach five-day courses probably once a month. And we'd have, on average, like 25 people in a course. And one of the first questions I always asked is, how many of you have been, well, actually, I said, I was saying, how many of you have been asked to do already before you ever were trained incident investigations and like 90 95 percent of the class raised their hands they'd already been doing them and i'd say okay how many of you have had any training any formal kind of training in human performance human what causes human errors human factors and i was lucky if i'd get one guy to raise his hand in a room and so i over the years i figured that's out about yeah, maybe 5% of the people had had some kind of training. Whether that was good training, bad training, and different, I don't know. But they'd had some kind of training. But the other people out there doing investigations, and certainly there were people reporting on these things in the press, had zero human factors training. And therefore, when they got to human error, that was the end of their knowledge. They didn't know any better. They, they couldn't go beyond that. And they might say training, right? That might be one of he could have had more training, or maybe maybe we should have had, they should have paid more attention. That's always a good one, right? Pay attention. Or maybe, you know, we should have written a procedure for that. A procedure would have helped. And then if they didn't use the procedure, we'll tell them to use the procedure. So those are the only kinds of things you'd see, because that's all that people had seen in the past. And so they didn't know about why people were making mistakes, and they certainly had no idea what you could do to fix them. Yeah. I, you know, when I used to review, do quality assurance on, you know, investigation, like just reading the reports, the documents back in the day, all paper, but, you know, I would flip all the way to the end and just look at the corrective and preventative actions. And that told me a lot, you know, how they were written. Um, and you're right. You don't do that. <laughs> when I <laughs> first got fix. to DuPont, my boss sent me a stack of, uh, here, let me get this way so people can see, a stack of reports to read. There, there were probably 100 or so reports in it. And he said, and he had put a little note on top, said, uh, Mark, read these and tell me what you think. 
and I was fresh out of the Navy, and um, I read them, and I wrote back, and it just a little sale sticky on top. I wrote bullshit across the top and sent it back to him, and that wasn't good DuPont terminology. He had to have me come explain that. He was all concerned, and I said, well, you can read these, and you can see by what they wrote, and you can see by the corrective actions that they have that this isn't going to fix the problem. They didn't really find out why the person made a mistake, and nothing they did is going to keep that person from making a similar mistake in the future. So that's, you know, one of the things they've noticed is these things had a cycle that in every two or three years or four years they'd repeat. And I'd say, well, it's no reason, you know, there's a reason why they're repeating because you aren't fixing the problems. You just keep having over and over and over again. And, and being careful works for a while, right? You don't make the same mistake the next day, but sooner or later a new guy comes in or the old guy gets complacent, you get the same mistake again. So that's, that's what we really found, and that got me started on doing better root cause analysis or, or developing a system for everybody to do better. Yeah, and we'll get to a, a system uh, here in a, in a moment because that's, that's critical. And the other thing that's funny is we this over-reliance on what I would call a cultural defense, tribal knowledge. Like, oh, no, anybody that works over there knows you're not supposed to do X or Y because it got them once in the past or they saw their buddy get it. So they all know. The problem is, is when we rotate them out, we don't transfer that that knowledge and they experience it again, and therefore we see it as a trend. So a couple of things. Um, let me, let me one, just comment on it for yeah, just a second. Um, I had this guy call me on the phone, and he had a particular incident, and he was explaining it to me, and he, and he was going to blame the guy, right? He was going to blame the guy. And what happened was – It was a a steam plant of some kind, and when it tripped offline, you had to relieve the pressure of the steam before you could start the unit back up. And there was a handle you could pull to do that. Well, the problem was the steam came right out at where the handle was. So you'd get scalded if you pulled the handle. So in a long story short, he said, well, everybody knew as soon as they pulled that handle, they had to run. And he didn't run. That's why he got scalded. And and going back, Man. I said, well, was he, was he, you know, first I, I said, is there really a procedure for this? He said, oh, yeah, yeah there's a procedure for it. And I said, so I'm going to find some place. There's a manager's signature somewhere that says he pulls the handle, then he runs. Well, no, you're not going to find that. <laughs> and then, then he goes back to, um, well, he was trained. And I said, so he's fully qualified. Yeah, yeah. And well, except that he hadn't been work, he'd been off someplace else for three years, and this was his first day back to this unit. Wow! And so there you go. All the things that yeah, he was trained. Sure, he was three years ago, and this is his first day back. And he knew he had to pull the handle, but he forgot that the steam comes out right there, so he didn't run. And that must be the root cause. He didn't run. Must be more running. Need more running. So. You know, I love I love procedures, even policies that are they we call them vague enough to be accurate, right? That like forklifts. I always use this example: a must uh, must operate forklift in a safe manner. And I would ask folks, okay, if I'm watching you operate a forklift, how am I going to know you're doing it in a safe manner? And they would then explain to me. They would say, well, I would have to stop at every intersection. I would have to make eye contact and use my horn, eye contact with pedestrians. I'm like, okay, that's what you need to write. You need to write that down. Must stop. You, you need to spell it out. And because you can't leave it that open and say just operate no. it safely and not define it for them. Well, you can tell you can tell if it's unsafely because he'll run somebody over or <laughs> crash into something or one of those kinds of things. Well, yeah, but like all the other times he doesn't crash into something that he's operating it are lost opportunities where he's not stopping at the, you know, and just got lucky, right? So luck human is the error, ultimate safeguard. Luck, right? I know. Murphy's always on the job. I don't try. Yep. The old firefighter in me doesn't trust luck. Um, so let, let's get to human error. So okay. I've always told folks, look. If you if you identify drift like a very a deviation from a standard, right? Um, I'm doing something that according to some standard, whether I know it or not, is irrelevant at this point. But I've deviated from it. So there's operational drift. 
that's where we start digging. We don't stop. So what, what can a business do to help get their leaders, their managers, those doing incident investigations to push past human error? What like tip would you give them? Obviously we would want to want them to go through formal training and uh, some like taproot, but just us talking, what, what's one thing you could drop on somebody to say at the very minimum, if nothing else, do this. Well, uh, first, I've got to get back to your comment on operational drift, because I think that's a misnomer, but we'll go back there in a second. Yeah, yeah, go for it. What's the one thing I could tell people? You know, I think everybody's made mistakes in their life. And what you find is they usually blame themselves. And uh, I've had several people who were involved in major accidents who were very... um, took it all upon themselves, took it all like, oh, it's all my fault. And I, I remember one guy who was who, who had almost tried to kill himself over it because oh, wow. he, he it, there was a multiple fatality involved. He was the guy, quote, unquote, responsible. He had actually made a mistake, you know, made a mistake that happened. It wasn't the only mistake, but it was the the final mistake, if you will. And, and... The, the culture was then he's to blame. And he came to one of our courses and I just had, he was going to come give a talk at our summit. And I always let the, the people who've been involved in a blame oriented incident come to one of our courses. And the answer was he went to the course and he came out and said, Oh my gosh, I learned so much. I could actually see why I made mistakes. I could, there were so many thing, other things that went wrong and and that his particular one had had an NTSB investigation of it. And he said, these NTSB guys didn't ask any questions about this stuff. And there's so much else that needed to be learned from this. And we didn't learn it. And, and I think, I think it's hard to say there's just one thing, but once you can understand, you have to have a really good understanding of what happened first. You always have to understand what happened. And then you can start picking out, usually there's multiple things that went wrong, not just one. There's probably one last thing that went wrong, but there's lots of things that set it up and happened in the process. And any one of those, if you take them out, this wouldn't have happened. So you, you've got all these things, and it wouldn't have happened if you just would have taken one out. So it, it turns out the person who's usually holding themselves responsible, the person who's blaming themselves for something, they are just one cog in the wheel. And when they can see there's all these other cogs and they all had to fit together for this accident to occur, it's not like they don't take responsibility for their own actions, but they can see they weren't the only one who was responsible. And there's not only they they can change, but all these other things can change and keep this from happening to somebody else. Um, a real good example of that, we were teaching down at a refinery um, in Mississippi and they, uh, we, were, we were training all their operators and mechanics in a four-hour course. So we must have done, I don't know how many of these four-hour courses, but it was a lot because there were like 800 people on the site, and we trained them all. And the reason they were doing this is because they'd been very blame-oriented before this, and the operations manager came in and gave an introduction to every um, session we taught and he'd start out by saying, we'd been doing this wrong. We're now going to do it right. We're not going to blame people. We're going to find the facts. We're going to stop this from happening again. And then he'd, at the end, he'd say, "Everybody, anybody have any questions or anything to say? And this one lady stood up and she said, well, I want to tell everybody um, about this because I got taprooted the other day. And, <laughs> and she said, when they said they were going to taproot me, I thought it must be like a root canal and it was going to be bad because I'd made a mistake that cost $100,000 and I was pretty sure I was going to get fired. And she said, I went in there and we worked through what happened and we drew this thing called a snap chart and then we found root causes and I found out that it wasn't just me. It wasn't just me making a mistake. There were things that could have made anybody make a mistake. And we found ways we could fix those things so they won't happen to me or anybody else ever again. So I just want to tell everybody this is a good system and you ought to be doing this. And that's sort of like, that's the, that's the, she participated in one and she then knew 
that there was more than just blame, and they'd been doing blame in the past, and she expected to get blame again, but it didn't happen. And that was a real, a real eye opener. The other one was we were working at a different refinery out in the West Coast, and they had a strike going on at the gate when we got there to teach. And I'm like, oh no, we got to drive through a strike line. But then we rolled down our windows, and they handed us these flyers. And I was driving, and I gave it to the person who was in the passenger seat, and she said, "Pull over, I got to tell you something." And they were on strike because they'd fired a guy for making a mistake without doing a taproot investigation. And once again, it isn't about blame. It isn't about blaming people. But once you start seeing these things, you then start to see the world differently. And you know there's more to it than just human error. And whether you're a manager, whether you're a supervisor, whether you're one of the guys out in the field, once you see that, you don't see the world the same way again. But most people don't see that before that. Right. And so the big takeaway then from what I'm hearing is you can't, you know, going back to the beginning of even even in your intro, you know, you can't just hire somebody, say you're a supervisor, go investigate this incident, no matter how minor or, or severe, they have to have some, you have to have not just training, you have to have a process by which you you know, seek to uh, discover these root causes, these contributing factors, and and then, of course, solve for them. Uh, it yeah. isn't just that you check a box and went off to some training. You have to adopt this as a culture, right? Yes. Like you said, no blame. We, we've we adopted this no blame uh, approach. And, 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 I, and I don't want to say no blame, because if you find somebody who purposely did something wrong, of course... You know, you're going to have disciplinary action. But that isn't the point. The point is 99% of these things, it isn't blame that does that makes any difference. And all you're doing with blame is keeping people from admitting what happened. Because they're going to learn pretty quickly, hey, just say I didn't see anything. Just say I don't know what happened. I didn't touch it. And you won't get fired then. And it'll be the mystery event. Yeah, they there's go into survival of, mode, right? Yeah, <laughs> so there was a lot of bad drive. advice. There was a lot of bad advice out there on root cause analysis, and you mentioned one of them: smaller incidents. We can just give it to the supervisor, and they can, you know, check a box here, and you're done. Well, smaller incidents are the precursors to bigger incidents, and so if you're investigating a precursor incident that could have become a fatality, you ought to be treating that like a fatality investigation, and you ought to be learning the lessons and then keeping those fatalities from happening. And instead, they they farm these things out to people who aren't trained. Nobody pays any attention to them. The corrective action is a little bit more training, or tell them to be careful, or heck, we'll put a note in the procedure that nobody uses. And it just goes right on, and nothing changes. Yeah, that's a, those precursor events. I call them mulligans, man. That's a freebie. You, we should yep. be all over that one. I, I used but to. I think the point the, is when they call them a near miss, people don't take them seriously. No, they don't. And, and it's a precursor to a fatality. When you say it's a precursor to a fatality, all of a sudden, oh, maybe we got to take that seriously. Yeah. No, absolutely. I. I used to use this on uh, workers a lot when I would approach them. And, and, you know, folks rationalized even not getting involved or reporting these things. You know, a minor laceration and that just took a Band-Aid. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, what step of the process were you in? You know, what material were you handling or using or, or whatever? And they're like, ah, it was, look, it was not a big deal. You mean every time I ask for a Band-Aid or whatever, I, we've got to go through this? And, I, and I'm like, I'll tell you what. Instead of doing that now, why don't we wait until it's much worse? I don't know how worse. I don't know when. You might lose a finger. You might lose the hand. I don't know. But when it gets that bad, then we'll ask you. If when we when it gets it. bad, we'll decide to do something about it. Now, if we've yeah. been doing bad investigations all the way up to then, what are the odds we're going to do a good investigation at that After point? After that. Yes. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. So and, um, and by the way, when you have something really bad happen, yeah, people shut up. So it's much harder to do a good investigation after something really bad because people don't want to admit what they did. They don't want to get blamed for it. They don't want to have to go to court. They don't want to get fired. They just want to shut up and we and because everybody always thinks 
well, I'll just be more careful next time. That's what I'll do to stop this. And therefore, I don't need to cooperate in this big, huge investigation where people are going to get fired and everybody's going to get blamed because I already know we won't have this happen again. Yeah. Wow. And it's not true, but that's what people think in their heads. Yeah. And if you think about it, all those precursor events where you're doing it the right way, you know, those those are all that's you're in practice, right? It's going to come exactly. a little more naturally to you each time you do it. Uh, so you should get better every time. And then yeah. and then if you ever do have some, well, the first thing is you never want to have the bad thing happen to start with, right? Right. So you want these small ones to prevent the big one. But if you ever do have the big one, you'll be good at doing the investigations. People will know it's not blame oriented. They'll have examples of that before. And and they'll know that they want to cooperate because they're going to keep this from happening again. Yeah, it's like uh, I use the windshield wiper analogy. It's like uh, windshield wipers. When when do you figure out you need to replace your windshield wipers? When you, when you turn them on and you need to use them. <laughs> when, it's you it. when it's raining, yeah. So you don't want to wait until something like that happens. Obviously, you want to you want to use this for even nonconformity. Even when when you go and do safety walks or audits, and you see something that's not in a you know an expected state, you, you it's an opportunity to use these skills and to apply exactly. those, that knowledge and uh, be in practice. So in a proactive way, finding problems before they come incidents. Yeah. Okay, so now now we're getting into like you know preventing things from from happening uh, to, to sure. begin with. You mentioned drift. You mentioned uh, oh, yeah, got back to it. That's a buzzword, um, and I know I think I know what you're going to say, and and I'll agree with you. And I think I know why it's become so popular is because we're talking to non, you know, indoctrinated folks. We we have to give it a word like just well. There's a know, whole there's a whole bunch of drift. Groups. What do you do with it? There's a whole bunch of PhDs out there that talk about normalization of deviation or normalized drift or or drift. And and my philosophy is that is normal. Drifting, whenever you establish a high standard, people are going to start drifting almost immediately down to no standard. And, or and whatever's you, comfortable, right? Whatever, whatever's makes it isn't, sense. It isn't the high standard, it. that's for sure. And um, I was reading some Rickover stuff the other day. Uh, Admiral Rickover, Na- Nuclear Navy. He was the guy who created it. He's been dead now for years. But uh, good old Rickover was talking about the the day you establish a procedure, the day you train somebody to use repeatbacks. The day you get some high standard set, he said, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month, you go back, and they've started already to drift back to where they were before. And he said, that's normal. What's abnormal is keeping that drift from happening. And his claim was the commanding officer of the ship was the only one who could keep that from happening by directly interfacing with the people who were doing the job and making sure they didn't allow drift he didn't allow drift. The commanding officer didn't allow drift to occur. And so Rick overheld that commanding officer responsible for making sure there was no drift. And I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't read that before about him. I do a lot of reading about Rick over and uh, establishing high, high performance or what do you call them? Um, you know, the zero error kind of organizations. Right. And sure enough, uh, he had one. In fact, I find a lot of these people, a lot of these PhDs have never worked in a high performance organization. They go out and they observe an organization and think it's high performance. But uh, I was reading one about somebody writing about aircraft carriers and, avi- and aircraft aviation on aircraft carriers being a high performance organization. Or, uh, and, and I thought, no, they aren't. Yeah. What, what was that all about? Well, when I was in the Navy, they'd usually lose about one pilot per cruise. And they'd slam into the back of the ship, or they'd just not come back, or they'd crash into the water. They, they'd lose one. And so it wasn't, that isn't such great high performance. And so when you can start saying we've got zero accidents, and we've got that over a large number of facilities or aircraft carriers, or in this case, submarines and surface ships running nuclear reactors, and you can go 
10, 20, 30 years without, uh, in his case, a, a nuclear accident, um, then you've got a high-performance organization. But if you go a few weeks without an accident, that's not a human. That's not a high performance organization. And anybody, another one I think is always good. Is people will talk about, well, um, we're improving safety, but yet they're still having fatalities. If you're still having fatalities, it's not a high performance organization. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I've always cautioned people from you know. J- r- Focusing on the results, like we've had, uh, we've gone three months without a recordable. I'm like, you better get out of get out out of your chair and get out on the floor now and start walking around because I don't trust that. It it why what what brought that about? Well, we had three months without a reported recordable. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my question is always, how did you do that? I'm like, well, you know, we've got a great crew out there. They do. It. I'm like, ah, you stop. You you need to be talking about the efforts that were being made that you undertook, right? Uh, the systems and processes you have in place, and how you validated those, and continued, to, and how you iterate those and improve those. That if that's resulting in preventing these things from happening then I'm with you. But don't yep. tell me you you know, pat yourself on the back because we went three months, but then you can't tell me how. That's, that's yep. luck, I think, is what that is, right? That's so, exactly. So human error, we know that we got, you mentioned like 90 some percent or whatever. Do we, Is there data, generally accepted data in the industry that a company can use to say, like, we know human error can't be the root cause because this data says it's only present in what percent of, of incidents, industrial incidents, for example? Well, you could say it's present in 100% of incidents because all all accidents could eventually be traced back to some human someplace. To a person, yes. It's, it's usually a meteor struck me from the sky. Right. Um, so acts of God usually are, are thrown out. But for the rest, be, because we have people interacting with processes, machines, tools, equipment, yeah, there's a human element. So somebody designed it, then? somebody was using it, somebody was maintaining it, somebody was the supervisor. You can always find somebody to blame who made the human error. And and it's very easy and quick. The the uh, who did it investigation is much more difficult much more easier and, and less difficult than the go out and find why somebody made a mistake incident. So when yeah. when we say human error isn't is rarely the true root cause or a, you know, a true root cause. What are we talking about then in terms of like separating the person from, you know, the the human errors tend to be causal factors. And that's where you start your search for why, what you can do to change, change that human error into reliable performance so that they don't make that mistake again. Now, very seldom do you want there to be, one human error, and then an accident occurs because that's not a very robust system, not resilient or whatever they want to call it nowadays. Yeah, I think resilience um, is the buzzword now, I think. Yeah, yeah, you want to to have to make a dozen human errors before something goes wrong. Well, we we used to call it single point of failure. We used to call that, yeah. And if if you're counting on... If you're counting on one guy standing between you and the accident, you know you're going to have them. About the... Um, about the best human performance you can get is one mistake in every 10,000 times somebody does something. I mean, that's really, really, really really good human performance. But if that one mistake causes a big accident, that's a big deal. Um, So so one in 10,000 isn't good enough if you want zero. You're going to have to stack up several safeguards, some of those humans, some of those maybe systems or equipment and you want redundant safeguards so that you can get that number down to one in a million, one in 10 million. It's like winning the lottery. If you have an accident, you want it to be that rare. Okay. Excellent. That's great. That's great uh, feedback to consider because folks will ask me like, how can human error not be the root cause when the humans are involved? And um, so I love your explanation of it's a ca- It could be a causal factor like, or a trigger. Humans can trigger the lack of robust processes or defenses or things like that. 
they can not only trigger it, but they can fail to keep it from going forward. So what you have is some trigger back here, something goes wrong, and that thing keeps progressing, and there's chances to catch it and stop it, and those get missed as well. And then it finally gets down here, and maybe you've got some automated systems that don't work right, or maybe you've got some equipment that you've bypassed and the safeties are bypassed, and finally you get the big accident and you find out all these things have gone wrong. And so it's not just like the, the, the guy on the ship. It's not just the one error he made. It's all the errors that happen together. And the trick is looking and being able to spot and identify the, all those missed opportunities. And then yes. how do we shore that up? How do we error proof that? Right. Or is that yes. a, are allowed to say yeah, that? exactly right. You're, you wanted to spot every one of those and, and when I only spot everyone that existed, but you may also want to go back and say, was this enough? Was there enough? I mean, if there was just the one guy standing between you and an accident, you might say, that's not good enough. I need to change my system. I need to have a redundant safeguards here. I want to have an automated um, shutdown or something that's going to keep this from happening again. And I don't want to depend on the few safeguards we have, the weak safeguards we have. And maybe I even want to go back and remove the hazard, the source of energy, the thing that caused the damage. If I can, if I can go from a very hazardous chemical to a very benign chemical to run this process, well, why aren't we using the benign chemical? Why aren't we doing that? And then we don't have to worry about this hazardous chemical anymore. So there's a lot of those kind of thoughts too. Well, we talk a lot about the hierarchy of controls, and and again, yep. that's another indication of everyone. And it's it's natural. We all want to like just fix. What do I need to fix so we can get moving? Right. Everyone wants to be quick. I think what what we do what we can do is look at the corrective and preventative actions, and we can see if they've done enough. Right. If they have one or two corrective and preventative actions, or they have one five Y form with a single thread drilling that they upload and and provide, but. Look, I mean, we could talk. I would love to sit and talk for a long time. And I know your time is valuable. And I appreciate you coming on here and talking at least a little bit about human error and how we can better understand how that comes into play and contributes to some incidents that occur. Where can folks go to find more information about Taproot? www.taproot.com. Okay. And there's links there for our training. There's links there for our, we've got a summit coming up in May that um, really covers, we've got a whole track on human performance. And we've got a course called Stopping Human Error um, that will be right before that on the second and third that I would say is an advanced course on what you can do to keep these things from happening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. We should do this again. Maybe uh, pick a different topic or or something ah, no problem. And, uh, keep keep this thing going. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. All right. See you later. There you have it, everybody. Be sure to visit taproot.com to learn more information about that organization and all the work that Mark and his team have been doing over the years and the books that they have as well. A lot of literature, a lot of material that you can consume over there on their website. I learn a lot from the emails and the newsletters they put out. And, you know, it's always something that we need to be concerned with when, as safety professionals, we're leading these efforts in our organization that we do what Mark was talking about, and that is make sure that we prepare our operations leaders to conduct root cause analysis the right way consistently every time, and not just for severe incidents and events. This is something that should be an expectation for those precursor events Mark and I talked about, those near misses and even nonconformances that we see in safety walks and inspections. Those are all opportunities to prevent these things from spreading and becoming serious incidents. So go over to the Safety Pro Podcast community site and drop your comments. If you're not a member, think about becoming a member today. And I will talk to you on the next Safety Pro Podcast.